Have you ever approached a situation and you're all excited, but you hadn't fully grasped what was going to be required of you? Think about that for a moment. Think back in your life. Maybe you started a new project or you were taking on a new role or committing to a new responsibility. And at first, it's thrilling. It, you've got great hopes for the future and every new aspect feels exciting in those first days. But as you step further into it, reality kicks in. You realize the gravity of the project or the role that you've signed up for and you realize how much time and effort is involved. This reality can hit you hard and you say to yourself, this is not what I expected. In that moment, you might want to quit and walk away. The easier option would be to find a new role or responsibility, a new project, task, whatever it is. But this is often a mistake. There's a lot to be learned about digging in and working through the struggle. There's a preparation of heart and mind for an unexpected struggle that builds character. Moreover, there's a respect and honor that's required and earned to carry through on the commitments you've made. Now, there's also a larger benefit. It's in those moments that God uses the struggle to shift our perspectives and grow our faith. And in the end of the whole journey, it's often worth the digging in, the learning, the growing, instead of doing what we want to, which is walking away. We're going to talk about that today. But first, welcome to Mountain View Church. I'm Jeremy, and it's fantastic to have you here with us, whether you're in person or joining us online. I am so glad that you continue to journey through your faith with us. If you're watching online, we'd love to connect with you or stay connected with you. Visit mountainview.church connect or text connect to 867-322-8001. And you can get involved with one of our groups or ministries. It'll be amazing to have you. For those of you attending in person, please take a moment to fill out the Connect card found under the seats in front of you. You can drop it off at the welcome desk on your way out, and we'd love to meet you. For parents and grandparents, a quick reminder that our Base Camp Children's Program runs every Sunday morning during both our 9.30 and 11 a.m. gatherings. It's a great opportunity for your kids to grow in their faith and connect with other kids their age. Now, if you're unable to make it, you can download all the video lessons and activities at mountainview.church slash basecamp. Lastly, for our students out there, our youth group meets every Sunday evening from 6 to 8 p.m. Junior youth is gathering on the first and third Sundays, and senior youth is gathering on the second and fourth Sundays. Again, it's a great way to meet people your age and to grow in your faith with them. With all that being said, let's get back to today's message. Continuing our teaching called by God, Today, we're looking at one of those situations where the excitement of a role and responsibility soon turns serious. It's a biblical account taken from the life of David. He was on a mission, thrilled to bring the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. The Ark was no ordinary object. It was a sacred chest containing sacred objects and the visible sign of God's dwelling among his people. It held a deep, deep spiritual significance as a symbol of God's presence and promises. Now, as you can imagine, this was an incredibly honorable project. David was filled with anticipation and excitement to bring the ark to its rightful place. But suddenly, out of nowhere, that excitement was met with the sobering reality of God's holiness. David's initial enthusiasm soon transformed into a powerful understanding of reverence and obedience. He's suddenly face to face with a worship that pours out from a place of deep humility and submission. Now, this lesson isn't just for David's time. It's going to be a timeless call for each one of us to approach God with the same reverence in our lives today, here and now. So with that in mind, let's dig in. Open your Bibles and let's walk through this challenge. When David was called to lift up the Ark of the Covenant to its rightful place, receiving the joy of the Lord.
Hi, today we're going to be reading from 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 5 through 15. That's on page 258 in the Bibles that are in the seat in front of you. Starting at chapter 5. And David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him down there because of his error, and he died there beside the ark of God. And David was angry because the Lord had broken out against Uzzah, and that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day, and he said, How can the ark of the Lord come to me? So David was not willing to take the ark of the Lord into the city of David. But David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all of his household. And it was told King David, The Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, he sacrificed an ox and fattened the animal. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn. If you're new to Christianity and the Bible, this account can be really shocking. The severity of God's consequences in this situation can be just straight up overwhelming. And, and I'm sure it was overwhelming for David. But there is an important lesson to be learned. When we honor God by lifting him up in reverence, we open ourselves up to the joy of his presence. When we lift God up in reverence, we can be lifted up in joy. David's story found in 2 Samuel 6 shows this in a powerful way. Let's set the scene. David, filled with enthusiasm, he gathers all of Israel together, assembling people, musicians, and instruments to bring the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, all in joy and celebration. We read in verse 5, And David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord, with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. It was an all-out party. There was singing and dancing and music. It was a massive outpouring of joy as they celebrated God's presence. David's joy wasn't just in the excitement of the moment. It was rooted in a thankful heart. When we bring our thankfulness into our worship, it keeps us humble and centered on God's goodness rather than our own excitement or agenda. It's not just a feeling. But then something shocking happens in this situation that brings the entire celebration to an abrupt halt. Usa, one of the men guiding the ark, reaches out to steady it. When the oxen stumble, he touches it and he's struck dead instantly. Pfft, crazy situation. The celebration suddenly turns to fear. David, who was leading the joyful procession, suddenly felt a surge of emotion. The text tells us that David was angry because the Lord had broken out against Usa, and David was afraid of the Lord that day. You see, David is now face to face with the reality that God's presence is not to be taken lightly. It's a sobering wake-up call for David and all the people of Israel. He stops everything. He's angry, and yet he's afraid. After all, it's God. David realizes that God's presence demands far more than just enthusiasm. There's a depth and a holiness that's required. There's a seriousness to God that can't and shouldn't be approached casually. You see, in that moment, David understood that lifting God up in our lives isn't just about celebration. It's also about reverence. And that reverence is an important thing to contemplate even for us. When was the last time you contemplated the reverence of God? In our modern era and modern worship in the Western world, we don't often, do we? Do we? You see, this incident with Usa reveals to David and to us that God's holiness is no small thing. David's initial excitement transforms as he realizes the true worship 
that true worship requires both joy and reverence. He came face to face with it, face to face with the weight of God's presence. This story also reminds us that God's standards for holiness and worship are far beyond our control. They're also far beyond our human interpretation. Even though Usa may have had good intentions, let's face it, he was just trying to stop the ark from falling. God's standards are set by his wisdom, not by our assumptions. It's a reminder that when we approach God, we do so on his terms, not our terms. And so to honor God means recognizing his ways, even when they're difficult to understand. I get it. Sometimes it's hard. But because his ways are perfect and holy, it's about bringing our hearts under his guidance. Even when it's challenging, uh, all our assumptions and all our desires and, and all the things we think should be, it doesn't matter. He is God. Now let's come back to our story. David is thrust into a time of reflective waiting. After Usa's death, David steps back. He's thinking, processing. You can only imagine. He's delaying the journey to bring the ark to Jerusalem. This period of time likely becomes a time of growth. He has to reflect on what it means to approach God with true reverence. This pause is significant, and it should cause us to consider our relationship with God. You see, sometimes God calls us to wait. He calls us to realign our hearts with his. David's delay wasn't wasted, of course. It prepared him to approach God's holiness with a deeper understanding and a deeper respect. And so, just as David had to stop and reflect, we may be called to pause, maybe stop and reflect when things don't go as planned. We shouldn't fight these moments. We shouldn't run. We should accept them and embrace them. Embrace the reality that God wants to reshape us, reshape our hearts, teach us patience, and align our perspectives with His. Obedience often requires us to move at God's pace. It might challenge our perceived timing, and, and it definitely challenges our sense of control, but in the long run, it's for our benefit. The the timeline, the plans, the situations he sets out, it's for our benefit. Now let's get back to our story once again. We see David experience the joy of obedient worship now. You see, he hears about the blessing that has fallen on the place where the Ark of the Covenant has been left. Although the journey had been halted, God's presence was still among his people. And so David decides to resume his responsibility. He decides to continue the journey to Jerusalem. He didn't run. He didn't walk away. He didn't quit. He paused, reassessed, realigned, and then took up the task again, seemingly with more enthusiasm. You see, one might assume because of the previous events that David would travel with caution and trepidation, but he doesn't do that. His understanding of God is well-placed. He's learned something. He is still filled with the celebration of the previous journey, but now even more so, as his heart is so full of that reverence and obedience supplementing his celebration, supplementing his worship. He offers sacrifices along the way and approach Jerusalem with complete and utter devotion. In verses 14 and 15, we read this, And David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was wearing a linen ephod, so David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark to the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn. Now, maybe you're wondering why the linen ephod was mentioned. Why did David wear this garment and why would it matter? Why does, why does the author mention it? Why is it in there? If you're new to church, this could be odd. Now, one commentary explains it this way. The linen ephod worn by David was a garment of the priests signifying humility and devotion, showing that David placed reverence for God above his royal dignity. He considered himself not as king, but as a humble worshiper in the presence of the divine. Another author writes this, David's joyful celebration and the sacrificial offerings emphasize the sacredness of the occasion. Bringing up the ark was more than a royal procession. It was a commitment to make worship of Yahweh, God's name in Hebrew, 
central to Israel's identity. David's actions highlight a model of reverent leadership and obedience. David's journey shows us that reverence in worship elevates us to a higher level of joy. And that joy flows from honoring God's holiness. His experience teaches us the value of aligning our worship with God's power and majesty. And it leads to the intersection of that reverence and joy, that celebration and reverence and worship, the perfect union. Now, as always, the accounts of the Old Testament point us forward. David's journey with the ark is a powerful foreshadowing of what we now experience in Jesus Christ. The ark symbolized God's presence among his people, and David brought it to Jerusalem with deep reverence. But today, we don't need the ark to access God's presence. God sent Jesus. Jesus is our direct connection with God. Scrolling forward into the New Testament, we find a letter written to the Hebrew Christians. In chapter 10, the truth is revealed. The author writes, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Maybe you're new to all this. Let me explain it. On the cross, Jesus paid for our sin and satisfied God's wrath. Jesus made it possible for us to approach God's throne with confidence. As our great high priest, Jesus opened the way for a deeper, more personal relationship with God Almighty. By lifting Jesus up in our lives and our worship, we honor God's holiness while embracing the gift of grace that he's given. You see, Jesus fulfills the role of the Ark of the Covenant that was once a symbol of God's presence. God has come to us through Jesus. We're granted continual access to God's presence through faith in Christ. Because of Jesus, we carry the reverent worship of God with us wherever we go. Not just with the ark, not just in a temple, not just in a church building, everywhere. We can worship everywhere. Now, at this point in the message, you might be wondering, how do I apply this to my day-to-day -day life? It's a really great question because we've unpacked an important biblical account and we've connected the theological implications, but now what? How does this play out in everyday life? I'd like to give you five ways that reverent worship can be implemented starting this week. The starting point for this and the foundational practice is to set aside a daily time to worship God. One of the most impactful ways we can lift God up in our lives and experience His joy daily is by carving out a purposeful time with Him. Now, I know this isn't always easy depending on your circumstances. And if you're just starting your faith journey and you're new to this concept, it doesn't need to be elaborate. You might dedicate the first few minutes of your day to personal worship. Maybe you're going to find a quiet spot during your lunch break. Or maybe you're going to set aside the last moments in bed just to connect with God before you go to sleep. The key is consistency, making this time a natural rhythm in your life. Now keep in mind that this daily time with God can look differently for every single person. And it looks different in different seasons of life. I'm experiencing that now. Sometimes it'll be centered on prayer. Sometimes it's speaking to God out loud in your heart. Prayer looks different. Perhaps it's just sitting in silence to be in God's presence, waiting, meditating, watching, listening. Other times, it'll center around scripture reading or maybe even a deep study of God's word with a deep desire to learn. Sometimes it'll be like David, worship through singing and, dare I say, maybe even dancing in reverent worship. Can we do that? Really? You see, our daily time with God is a moment where we bring our entire being before Him. Another way to think about it is to think of building a daily altar, maybe a daily ark, for lack of a better term. 
don't take that too far theologically, but it's a sacred place where God is lifted up. And every time we intentionally enter into that space, we're essentially saying, God, you are here and you are first in my life and I am here to worship you. Let's move on to the second way. So the second way to implement reverent worship is to cultivate gratitude in all our circumstances. David's worship was rooted in a deep thankfulness to God. Honoring God daily means we recognize and thank him for his presence in our lives, even in the small things, no matter what. We enter every single day with a different mindset. This means we take time to express gratitude throughout our day whether for a specific blessing, or maybe it's an answered prayer, or it might just be for his ongoing presence. This shift in perspective can take us from a prideful place to a humble place pretty quick, because we're aligning our hearts with God's goodness, no matter what circumstances are going on, no matter what's going on in any given day. Now, let's move on to the third one. The third strategy to implement reverent worship into your daily life is to seek God's guidance in your decisions. We can lift God up by seeking his direction in our decision-making. Might be different, but yeah, in the decision-making, God is there. Instead of rushing forward with our plans, we choose to take time to pause, to pray, to ask, to meditate, to discern. We invite him in to those decisions. We're declaring his power and majesty by placing our decisions in his hands. We saw this reflected in David's challenge. I think we can assume it's there. He had to pause and consider how he should approach. How should he approach God in his journey after the incident with Usa? He was filled with anger and fear, remember? Yet he didn't really react, just paused. He reflected and then made his decision and moved forward. In a world that often encourages us to act quickly, to just go, 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 don't do it. God's holiness calls us to a different place and a different pace. <laughs> Waiting on God's timing, especially when it challenges our desire for control, it's an act of reverent trust. It, it declares His sovereignty over our lives. Pause during those decisions. The fourth component of reverent worship in our daily lives is to honor God through acts of service. David's journey wasn't just about him. It impacted the entire nation of Israel. He was serving them through his leadership. He was given that gift and ability and he used it. He was overseeing the transport of the ark to better serve all of God's people. It would have been easier to not sign up at all, to not do it at all. And, and you might not be called into leadership like David. That's fine. You're still called to serve in some capacity. You're given a gift and ability. And we can all lift God up by using our gifts and abilities to serve others. It fosters a heart of humility and submission. And many times it fosters a level of compassion. This might look like a simple act of kindness or helping someone in need. Or it might be accepting a significant role of responsibility. Even one that maybe is a little scary and maybe goes a little sideways when we start. We dig in. We give it to God. We serve in reverent worship. Regardless of the task, when we serve others, we kindle a heart for God. Our service itself becomes the act of worship. Moreover, every act of love and compassion shows others God's love and making our daily lives a reflection of His grace, pointing them to Jesus. Now, the final way to implement reverent worship is to make worship a shared experience. David didn't worship alone. He invited all of Israel to join in. Similarly, we can deepen our worship by involving family and friends, neighbors, and coworkers. This often happens during Sunday morning worship in the Western world, but it doesn't have to stop there. Try embracing worship in a community group or a Bible study or prayer meeting. There are times of teaching and questions and answers, allowing God to move in our minds, but maybe it looks a little different. Perhaps you share accounts of God's goodness and, and His presence. And you share and tell each other about how God has worked in your life, how he's answered prayer and how he's provided in times of need. This is all also worship, corporately together. You see, entering into those corporate times of worship with others can strengthen our connection to God. 
and it strengthens our connection with each other. And it enriches our sense of his presence. And so as we put these practices into action, it's important that we remember one element for reverent worship, maybe more important than any others. And that element is sacrifice. I know, not popular, but it's important. For us, it might mean freeing ourselves from distractions. It might mean adjusting priorities so that we can focus on God more instead of some worldly pursuit. It might be as simple as silencing our phones, stepping away from a device, carving out an intentional moment in the busyness of the day and just say, God, I'm here. I, I turned off everything. I walked away. I'm here. It's small, but it's sacrifice. And when we offer those daily sacrifices, big or small, time, attention, our focus, we are sending a message. We're declaring something. We're saying, God, you are worth my best. You're worth my here and now. And in return, his presence fills our lives. We're brought into a place of deeper joy, higher joy, maybe I should say. And it flows from aligning with him. You may have been going to church your entire life, but remember that true worship doesn't happen just on Sundays. That means that we lift God up in every aspect, every part, every day of our lives. In our decisions, in our relationships, in our work, in how we treat others. All of it, everything we've mentioned today, that can all be worship. It's a mindset of reverence, of holiness, righteousness, of celebration. You can carry a heart of reverent worship into every setting, whenever and wherever you go, anywhere. You see, when we honor God with reverence, our lives begin to reflect His peace and joy. That reflection is important because it, it gives us a sense of purpose. It, it sets us on a right trajectory that nothing else can, can get us there. Nothing else can bring that about. As we close today, we're going to pray. And we're going to give thanks to God for His gift of grace through Jesus. We could never approach such a holy and righteous God on our own. We needed Jesus. And Jesus has made a way for us. And so we're going to prayerfully submit our hearts one more time, maybe for some of you, or for the first time for some of you. And we're going to respond to this amazing gift of grace with reverent worship. Will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for your holiness, your grace, and love. We stand in awe, grateful that through Jesus, we can come close to you. Forgive us for where we've fallen short and help us to honor you with our lives. We accept your gift of grace. May our hearts respond to you in reverence. May our lives reflect your peace and presence. As we leave today, remind us that true worship is lived out every day. We lift you up, Lord, and ask that you fill us with your joy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for watching today and for being a part of Mountain View Church. Once again, please connect with us. Mountainview.church slash connect or text connect to 867 322 8001, that number on the screen. We want to keep you informed on what's happening in our church community. That being said, please stick around a little bit longer as we have a few important ministry updates. First off, I would like to invite you to the first ever Church Boards 101, happening this Sunday, November 10th at 1230 p.m. This is a workshop that offers insights into how our church boards work, how any church board works. It includes how decisions are made and how charitable status and nonprofit principles apply to church leadership. It can all be confusing, and so we want to talk about it, explain it. You want to learn? We're going to teach you. The best part is lunch is provided. So be there, November 10th, 1230. We'd love to have you. Hi, Mountain View. I'm Haley, and I'm announcing an event that is upcoming this Saturday, November 16th. I'm referring to it as the Multi-Generational Mixer, 
and the purpose is to spend some time intentionally connecting our young adults community with the seniors in our congregation. Personally, I'm really looking forward to us all spending an afternoon together. This event is open to young adults age 18 to 35 and seniors ages 60 and above. The plan is to spend time mingling, conversing, um, playing some games and having some snacks and praying together. So there will be coffee, tea and snacks provided. Um, but if you have a favorite card game or board game, I would love if you could bring that and teach us your favorite game. And yeah, if you have, okay, a couple more details. 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. Saturday at the church will be on the main floor. And yeah, if you have any questions at all about this event or about our young adults ministry, please email me, haley at mountainview.church. And I really hope to see a lot of you this Saturday. Have a great week. Open their boxes, you can hear the laughter, the cheer. Jesus said, let the little children come to me. I want the children to know that Jesus Christ is alive and he'll come into each and every heart that invites him. The mission of Operation Christmas Child is to share the gospel with children around the world. Because we bring gifts to the children, the mothers and the fathers accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. This box gives us a chance to show them that there is a light, there is a truth. Millions of children around the world are being impacted by these simple shoebox gifts. So we need to keep packing those boxes and continue to pray for the children around the world as we begin to disciple them. God bless you. Thank you. Hi, church. I'm Barbara. And I'm Rainbow. We're volunteers with Operation Christmas Child, and we attend Mountain View. We are passionate about the mission of OCC to bring the gospel of Jesus to children all over the world. Mountain View has been involved with this ministry for many years, and we invite you to join us again this year in packing more shoeboxes. You'll find the shoeboxes and a list of suggested, suggested items on the table at the back of the church and downstairs at base camp. You'll also find a sign-up sheet for volunteer opportunities there. We're looking for volunteers to help receive shoeboxes from churches and other community groups during Collection Week, happening from Wednesday, November 20th, to Sunday, November 24th at Riverdale Baptist Church. If you'd like to contribute but are not into packing shoeboxes, you can donate or pack a shoebox online at samaritanspurse.ca slash OCC. Filled shoeboxes can be brought back to Mountain View until Sunday, November 24, after the second service. Finally, and most importantly, we appreciate your prayers. Your prayers are vital in sharing the love and hope of Christ with children, their families, and their communities in more than 100 countries around the world. If you have any questions, you can reach out to Rainbow, myself, or Carolee Johnson at UConnOCC at gmail.com. Well, we've come to the end of today's online gathering. As always, we don't just want you to consume content. We want you to process it and increase the opportunity that you have for spiritual growth. With that in mind, it is time for our discussion and prayer focus. That means you get to discuss and pray with the people you're watching with right now, wherever you're at, or you can drop a few comments, thoughts, prayers in the comments section below. And if you're in-house, gather into a small groups, a couple people, and have a great chat. So here we go. Let's get started. Ask the person beside you this question. What's your plan to lift God up in reverent worship this week? What's your plan to lift God up in reverent worship this week? After some discussion, spend some time in prayer, asking for increased joy in our worship of God and service to others. Ask for increased joy in our worship of God and service to others. Please come back next week as we continue our Called by God series studying Esther's call to move up. We're going to learn how Esther courageously approached King Xerxes, risking her life to plead for the safety of her people. Esther's story challenges us to use our influence for God's purposes, even when it requires incredible courage. Invite a friend and let's answer God's call together.